Well, let me ask you, if you don't mind me asking kind of a general question. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted that the facility here actually has internet for us, which is not what you expect when you come to a hotel often. Uh, and so in preparation for the three workshops I'm doing, I had 100 plus PowerPoint slides because what are you going to do if you can't get on? But now I think we have some opportunity to kind of play a little bit. So we'll kind of do a little bit of both. I'm interested in how much uh, usage all of you have done. How many of you have very kind of minimal knowledge of Mission Insight? Like you've been a little bit. So there's two, three of you, four of you. Get away. Uh, tell us who you are, would you? I will. My name is Kathy Hall. And I wanted to go get my computer. I love Mission Insight. There's so much. Well, I love you already. So go ahead. Uh, Okay. And can I introduce myself? Yes. Um, I'm Kelly Coker Ross, and I am a part time pastor in Susquehanna Conference and assistant pastor for Protestant Campus Ministries at a university. Okay, excellent. Tell us who you are. Ooh. Ooh. You're ooh. I'm Marsha Banks. Okay. Um, I am um, a lay member at the New Journey in Harrisburg, part of the Impact Harrisburg. Okay. And I'm also a missionary. Excellent. All right. Glad to have everyone. Uh, my background, I, I came initially out of what was Central Illinois Conference years ago. I was on the conference staff doing church development, so that tells you how long ago it was, about 1990 or so. And then uh, did a church plant in Florida. And during all of that, and so I'm a member of the Florida Conference, during all of that, my journey said, how in the world do we do this work if we don't understand our neighbor? And especially if you're a conference staff person and you have to have make missional decisions about where and who and what, you clearly need to have more than just being on the ground. And being on the ground is incredibly important. We all know that. But there's so much going on, so much drama and change out there and diversity. Uh, I think that's what we bring to the table is the ways to get at that. So one little interesting wrinkle for today, which is a good thing. We are migrating from the Google Map platform to a new mapping platform. And the reason we're doing that is increased functionality. Some very, uh, very exciting new things the system will do. You're not going to have to relearn the whole tool if you're a familiar person with it. Uh, but there are going to be some really, uh, I think, very helpful additions. So I'm going to try to demonstrate some of that with a group this size. I'm going to go back and forth between a PowerPoint and trying to go live. I tell you about the new map because it's not online yet, but it's in beta on our system. So I'm on the beta that it's not live, and the engineers are still working on it. So we might get a ah, possibly. I can go back to the system that's currently online if I need to. But I want you to see some of the new things that are happening. And uh, I'm going to move very quickly through some kind of conceptual framework things that most of you know about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But, but simply to say, um, the, the challenge we have with Mission Insight is getting past reports. You all, you all know that if you're working at conference level. Everybody wants to get their, quote, Mission Insight report. And that translates to a you know 10-mile radius, because if I get a 10-mile radius, I'll know more. The, the exact opposite is true. And so. Uh, about five years ago, we began to talk about the fact that it takes multiple views to understand the environment. So if we're talking about local church, we're talking about a district or a conference, there is no single report that tells the story. It can't be done. So the multiple views from our perspective start with what we call core view, and that's the identity of a congregation. Or for, for that matter, uh, really, um, in the perfect world, like in North Georgia, where North Georgia has plotted something like 135,000 United Methodists, you have a picture of a district that's very different when you have all the churches on the map and all of their people on the map. So, if, and I'll tell you, five years ago, when we talked about plotting people, we got resistance. Because people said, oh, what are you going to do with all of our information? And oh, who's going to know it? And you, well, the reality is we have over 5 million now. So it is a, it's really moved along. So the first view is looking at who are we um, in a congregation, what is the capacity we have, 
what in fact is the financial potential we may have, and so on. The second view we call a uh, community view, it's who is our neighbor. It's not just the census data, it's all of the data sources we use. And when you, when you uh, merge or fuse the answers to those two questions, who are we and who is our neighbor, that's when you get to the place where uh, strategic decisions happen. Uh, we use a comparative insight report really to get at the answer to that third question for a local church. We'll take a look at that uh, in a few minutes. So for those of you that are less familiar with where it all comes from, I'm going to go through this rapidly. Yes, sir. What, um, I missed three. Okay. Sorry. It, it's called Fusion View. That's all right. You know, I, I think we're probably going to be able to make this available to the PowerPoint. But no one has, we haven't, I haven't worked that out. But that's certainly uh, possible. By the way, I offered earlier Anybody that wants some personal time with us, we'll do a webinar with you. We'll, you know, at conference level, that's important. So we'll do that. Okay, everybody got it? All right, moving on. Four types of data. Where does it all come from? The ground floor of everything we do is uh, from a company called Synergos, which means nothing to you, but there are multiple uh, organizations that take the census data and do a current year estimate five-year projection, 10-year forecasting, welcome, we're glad that you're here. And uh, so what Synergos does, um, just so you know a little bit about accuracy, because one of the things conference staff people get asked all the time is, is this any good? Uh, how do you know? And so on and so on. Uh, Synergos, um, when they measured their accuracy from one census to the next, from 2000 to 2010 at a uh, county level, their margin of error, now imagine projecting real presence nine years after the census. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, less than 1% margin of error at county, county level. So they're very good. They have little clients like Walgreens and uh, Panera Bread and so on. So tell us who you are and where you're from, would you, uh, Victor, so everybody knows who you are. And your superintendent? Yes. Very good. Glad to have you. So uh, what Synergos does is they do what the others do, but they do something else. They, they actually track changes in zip plus four. Zip four is three to ten households at the end of your postal code, you know, and in an urban center it might be one building. Um, if a zip four changes, there's a population shift, obviously, and so they know there's changes going on, and they confirm mail delivery. We don't know of anybody else that does this, and they do it monthly. We don't know of anybody that does that. So quarterly, the information is updated. We update our core data twice a year. So you're gonna see changes in our numbers in fall and winter, spring and summer, typically. The second source uh, is Experian. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later quickly. So I'll just say to you, it's one of the credit companies. You're aware uh, that every time you use your credit card, pay your utility bill, buy a car, Experian knows you and they actually <laughs> collect 300 data points uh, on U.S. households. Sorry, I'm standing in front of you. And so um, that is a source of lifestyle information. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Quadrennium is our national survey. We've done twice, American Religious Beliefs, Preferences, and Practices. Um, over 100,000 samples when we do the initial survey. It is then projected across the country into your church locations, your districts, and so on. Uh, we're going to look at some reports, uh, hopefully, if we have time to do that. So, um, how do we do it? There's a white paper on the help menu. You can read it if you'd like to know more detail, but the summary of how we do it is this. The responses from the 100,000 surveys were distributed across the United States based upon two filters. One is the census region, and the other is the presence of uh, the group, the Experian group, groups around your church or in your district. That way the margin of error, is, the confidence level uh, is two to three and a half percent, um, 80 to 95 percent uh, confidence level. So is it a stone tablet? No, of course we say it's not a stone tablet. Um, but very good, very directional, very helpful, largest sample samples ever been done. It's far larger than the national samples you see out there. So it's the second one 
that we've done uh, and we'll be doing another one. Quadrennium is not a great name, so you'll know this as the Ministry Insight and the Religious Insight Reports. That's what is powered by this, this research. And finally, Epsilon is an organization that tracks consumer behavior and it powers our address lists and neighbor center. So uh, we have rooftop information from Epsilon, okay? Can I move on? Okay, all right. So one of the things that um, I want to start with is the user assistant window. Um, and I want to start with plotting people. And the reason I want to start there is that really is the place to start with a local church if you're working with them. Uh, even small churches uh, can do this. Uh, one of the things about uh, people plot is there are now two templates you can use. The default template is what 90% of, 95% of our churches use. It's an Excel template. If you haven't seen it, um, you can't change it. It's a template you can use, and I'll show you that in a minute. The other one is a custom template. Some churches have, I don't know, they have uh, small groups, and they want to create a plot for their small group so they can track things like that. You can do that. If you have a school, you can create a custom plot that way. So there's all kinds of features uh, that you can use if you decide you'd like to use that add new people type functionality. In order to use the comparative insight report, you have to have plotted people. So that's the only report of our predefined reports that require a plot. Why? Because you're comparing households in a church with households in the community, or households in a, in a district with households in the district, so you can kind of see. If you took this a step further, in the North Georgia Conference, for example, when they have 135,000 Methodists plotted, you can do a profile of United Methodists in North Georgia because they have enough uh, people plotted that we'll know the top two or three household types that Methodists reach in North Georgia. So the more you do in your conference in terms of plotting or in your district, the better in that regard. So uh, to upload people, you have to have a, a access called church administration. I'm sure most of you in this room have it. If you don't, when you come online, this is grayed out and it says you have to call us will give you church admin. Why is that? You don't want everybody messing around with church data. And you don't want people to retrieve it that shouldn't be retrieving it. So that's the reason for it. Once you have that access, you can upload people. And basically what happens is you click Next. And there are the two options for the default template and the new people type template. And really all a church needs is first name, last name, address one, address two, city, state, and zip code. That's really all they need to do an upload. Um, one of the things we hear, small churches, we don't have a database, we don't know anybody, blah, 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 you know. Look, if you've got 40 people in your church, uh, you can take the template and somebody in 30 minutes can type it. So, so that's a smoke screen. They either want to do it or they don't want to do it. And I've been around too long to mince words around those kind of things. People either want to know or they don't want to know. And there's ways their, their, their grandson can do it for them or granddaughter can do it for them, whatever. So, all right. So th this is the option in the template for member status and member by means. There are some churches that want to track their visitors. There are some churches that want to display just their visitors, just their members, active attenders. Maybe they want to display just their p people that have profession of faith. That's what this does. You can use the codes that are here. So if John Smith has just professed his faith in the member my means column, you put a one. Or you can tailor those codes to whatever your database has, and that's all I need to say about that. So we're going to plot people. We're going to select congregants. It's the North Georgia Conference. We're going to click Next. Now, you, when you go in as a conference user, you're going to see all of the churches that have been plotted in a great big list like this. And they're all checked by default. So we're going to plot them all, OK? Keep in mind, we're looking at a new mapping platform that looks a little different than what you're used to seeing now. So that's the good news, really. So we're going to click Next and move on. And guess what you get now? This is essentially doing the heat map for you. For those of you that use heat map at all, you know what I mean. What heat map does is it shows you where clusters of people are. And especially for local churches, understanding where clusters of people are, that's small group ministries in the districts, for example, where are most of your, your members clustered? So this is the 
South Georgia Conference. They have 132,602 people plotted. And so now what I want to do is I want to turn on the district layers because I want to see the districts along with the plots. You with me, everybody? So there's a layers uh, icon on the navigation bar. We select it. And at that point, there's an option in the layers menu that says custom boundaries. You select districts. And then if you click on the A, it turns on the labels for the districts. If you click on the selector icon, a little looks like an arrow, you can then select any of the districts you want to report on. Uh, so now when you have the district boundaries, you can also select, select an individual district like Atlanta Roswell. When I do that, I'm isolating that district, and I know how many people from the entire conference are plotted in that district. Everybody following me? So at this point, we know that of all the 132,000 people, 27% of them are in that district, at least those that have been plotted. If you select another district, you're going to find down, even though this has got a lot of coverage by, by looking at the map, it's only 3%. So of course you have density of population and all of that that comes into play. Uh, so one of the very interesting things now is automatically the system will allow you to zoom in and zoom out and it will change how you see the plots. So let us pray. I'm going live um, and we're going to give this a, a try. I'm going to actually plot this. This is what we just did by PowerPoint. So I'm, I'm now going to the system. Come on now. It was working. There we go. Congregants. And we're going to click next. Now you can, all, you, can, you can choose any individual study or all of them. If you wanted to plot some of the attributes, you can. So for example, you can plot by distance to church. If you wanted to plot all of the visitors in the annual conference, if churches did that, you could do that in theory. All right. Most churches don't use that, that level. Honestly, I've got to tell you, that's typically not the case. Uh, but anyhow, let's go back a minute. And we're going to go next, and we'll do all studies. The other thing that's uh, available is distance to church. That's a nice way to plot if you're doing individual churches. We'll do that in a second. Um, you can also show the labels for every person plotted, the household, uh, head of household. And this is a new feature. We can do it now, but it's changing a little bit. Click next. Let's take a look at this. And we are going live now. There are all the churches, and it's doing the plotting. And keep in mind, there's 138,000 to load here, so you know there's quite a bit for us to see. But it's worth taking a moment so you can see this happen real time. Any questions about anything as we're waiting for this to materialize? Making sense so far? Just on the data part of it. The data part? Mm -hmm. The, you mean the people? You can you can load new new data every day. It just it it, it just it, it's an you do it yourself. It automatically updates the file. It's there. So, well, this was moving a little uh, quicker earlier. Uh, so of course, what I'm going to do? My goodness, I may have to go back to the PowerPoint if it if it's going to take that long to load. Yeah. Okay. So now watch what happens as I zoom in. Hmm. What you should be seeing is clusters appearing. It's taking a while. Let me zoom in a little tighter. As you get into a closer look, then you, can, you begin to see them break up to individuals, individual households. So here's what's changed in the new uh, interface. All of this uh, use of heat map is done automatically for you. It, it will display at whatever level you're zooming to. So you can see right now as, it's, it, as you move out, it's beginning to cluster. You can see where these clusters are at this point. So it's a little better in that regard. Okay? And of course you can change the color of the plots and we'll take a look at that uh, as well in a minute. But uh, I've got to keep moving. All right. 
So if we decided we didn't like this particular color of green, we can click on this green icon and choose whatever color we want. And you can also turn on the churches, which we've done here. And so if I decide I want this to be red, I'm going to click up here. And now the, the colors are all red, so you can change. But I like red. I think it shows up a little better uh, in terms of the, the mapping itself. Uh, you can plot multiple churches. How many know about plotting multiple churches? Is this, have you all done this in the room, or is this new? Yes? No? Okay. So, so basically, with the system uh, now, let's go back to the... Uh, we'll go back to the uh, user assistant window. We're going to go to plot people. And this time, instead of plotting all of the churches, we're going to select the ones we want. So I'm going to turn this off and literally select the churches that I want to appear on the map. So typically, here's one in Decatur. Let's see if we can find another Decatur one here. All right. Here's Decatur first. For time, I'm going to plot two, just so you can see. We've selected two. We're going to click Next. We want to legend this by the church because we want the two churches to show up separately. I'm going to turn on the ability for us to look at labels, and we're going to click Next. This is a summary of what we've done, and you can go back if you need to. Click Finish. And one of these churches is great big. So now you can see, as I'm zooming in, what happens. You're beginning to see it emerge. And let's say I want the... Um, Decatur first to be a different color. So I'm going to select that and say, I think I'd like Decatur first to be green. So now those will turn green. And I'd like uh, Avondale to be red. Whoops, what I've done by inadvertently is turn on the conference boundary. So let me turn that off. So now can you see what's happening? You're seeing the, the two churches and people really displayed right over the top of one another. And you can go to any one of these and click the button, and you can see the person that is in that household, head of household. So think about that from a local church perspective as well. All right, let's move on. Hey, can I add just an advantage of doing that from a new church developer's perspective? Sure. That's right. That's right. The other thing is, uh, I'm sure those of you that have used this in, in a new mission, uh, if you have a core group, that's when you want to understand your mission area and plot that core group of 30 people or 40 people. Why? Because at that point, you can then look at the lifestyles of those core households. Do they look like the target that you're going after or not? And if they don't, you're going to have an issue, potentially, uh, with a new church plant or a new mission start in that regard. Okay? I, if everybody doesn't understand that concept, I can talk with any of you afterwards a little bit about that. So uh, what I've done here is I've illustrated uh, one single church, and I think it's worth taking a moment to do that because I can do it quickly. This is in Decatur, uh, a single church in Decatur. And we did distance to church. I really recommend distance to church as a plot for a single church because you can now see what's going on and you can change the color coding for all the people under, you know, for example, under two miles. If you, if you want to see them in red, then what you can do, of course, is draw a shape around them and you can retrieve a, a data list, an address list for all those people under two miles uh, in the neighborhood around your church. So any of these colors can be customized. And you can see what I did earlier there. I illustrated that earlier. So. so here's the number one question. And later, I'm going to be working um, with um, mission alignment and also with small churches. I'm amazed that this is not the first thing people do. How, how does demographic information 
work for you if you don't know your neighborhood that you're target. And churches do not understand how to do that. They don't understand how to do that because there's just been a habit of doing radius reports and, and they think bigger is better. Yes, so those of you that work, you, you know that's the case. Um, and so uh, if you plot your people, you can draw a shape around 80% or more of your people. Are you with me? And that then allows you to see the reach of your congregation. Does that make sense to you? This is often not their ministry area. This is 1,545 square miles. <laughs> and that's, that is 80% uh, of the people in this congregation. Now, it's pretty clear to me, looking graphically, that's sort of ministry area number one. Does that make sense? And then here, you're going to have a second area potentially, maybe a third area. These are potential small groups. Uh, house churches, all kinds of things you can do when you know uh, where these folks are. How would you implement uh, starting a new worship experience using this technology? Well, you can draw a shape around any one of those clusters. You now know the households and families who live there, and those are the folks you begin to talk about, talk to, I mean, when you're thinking about something new. Anybody have that experience? Have you done that in the room, someone here? Don't know? Yes. We actually had um, a cluster that was on the outskirts on this Tuesday church last year, and I realized that they were traveling 30 minutes. Right. We had a bunch of them back there for a job, so we did um, a small uh, study out there, and they actually worked with another church with um, a mission central mm -hmm. to do stuff, so they see everything there, but they come to our church to worship. Excellent, excellent. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the system, you recognize this as the toolbar on the left side. It's a little different in the new mapping interface. What happens when you actually come to select draw a shape, now the shape tools are going to appear over here and you can close this window and sort of work with the shape tools if you want. It's a little better for real estate, we think. And uh, so we, we've kind of refreshed how that works. Um, when you create a report, you're going to draw a shape. You can rename the study. Someone asked me the other day uh, at this meeting, can you create a report with a customized name? Obviously you can. This would normally say prepared for North Georgia UMC. We put the church name in. We put, and this I think is, you do whatever you like. When, when the report is generated, I like it to tell the story of the geography. So I say 80% of people because that's what the geography represents. That's what I drew. That makes sense? And so then I'm going to, to select the Comparative Insight Report, and we're going to generate that report. So let me just show you a couple of things about this report, if you're not familiar with it. And for those of you that are, I'm sorry, there's some that are and some that aren't. But the thing that the Comparative Insight Report tells you is there are 360 people plotted in this church in 180 households. In the study area, there's 33,400,000 people in 1,300,000 households. What does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, whoops, went too fast. The penetration rate of this church in Decatur is 0%. And the reason it's 0% is the density is so high. But for mainline churches, most of the time, uh, the density is 0.1, 0.2, if you are a mega church, you'll be at 1%, maybe 1.5%. If you happen to be in a Roman Catholic world, it's 3%, maybe 4% because their people are much tighter clustered in geography. But what's important is what you're seeing up there that says number of mosaic segments in the study area. We haven't talked about specifically about mosaic. We mentioned it earlier, the lifestyle segments. There are 71 in America. 71 in the United States. Guess how many are in this study area? 71. What does that tell you? Most diverse community possible. How many household types does this church reach? 36 of the 71, which actually is pretty darn good. Uh, but what are the 36 and where are their strengths? So what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the congregation on the right of the report and the community on the left. 
And on, how many of you in the room, how many of you have worked with the, the Comparative Insight Report, you understand everything I'm saying? A couple of you, two or three of you? Yes, four of you? Uh, okay. It, can, is it all right if I go through this quickly for the, for the rest of the room? I, I, so basically, what you're seeing here is the head of household age in the community, head of household age in the church. We're looking at the household's numbers by head of household age. Because we know with every household what the mosaic household type is, we can build a profile. So when you see numbers above 100 on the index score on the right, that means there's an overrepresentation of that particular variable. So in this list, where are the big numbers? This congregation has more uh, in the older ages and they're missing some of the younger ones, right? So that's what you're, you're seeing here. Then if you look at the different mosaic codes in the community, you find the number one in the whole study area is called suburban attainment. Well, this is kind of a bullseye for this church because they've got 56 households in that number one segment. So what, 31% of all their households, what does the 308 mean? It means you're three times more likely to see suburban attainment sitting in the pew of this church than if you walk down the street because they have more of those household types. And where are they missing opportunity? Striving single scene. There's 71,000, they have one. All right? So this is how you use the tool to begin to think about how are we doing with certain household types? Are there opportunities? Do we have the capacity as a congregation to get after some of that kind of work? For every demographic report in the Mosaic page, in the report, all three of them, there's a e-handbook link. If you haven't downloaded that, you can download it. There are two videos. The reason I'm making a point of this is your churches are going to say, what do we do with this stuff? There are live links for them to watch the video about how to use and understand the mosaic household types. There is also a link to the mission impact guide, which goes further in assisting a church to unpack this. For those of you that don't know about Mosaic, this kind of represents the 300 data points that are collected on every, on 95% of U.S. households. Uh, everything from ethnicity to length of residence to their job to their age. Anyway, you, you get the picture. And what happens then is they build this portrait of 71 unique household types, starting with the most affluent in America in Group A, Moving to group S, which is the least affluent, segment number one, American royalty, A01, is the most affluent. Segment number S71, tough times, is the least affluent. So when you start looking at names, these names are so indicative of, of what these household types are. And so you can see, for example, kids in Cabernet, A03. And uh, one that I love is uh, golf carts and gourmet. If you do any work... If you do any work in, uh, in Sarasota, Florida, you're going to see golf carts and gourmet all over the place. That's right. And then here's the, some of them that you see. In, in, a, in every one, I would venture to guess, in 90% of, of our churches in Methodism, this segment called Town Elders is present. It would be a rare, rare thing. Now, maybe the youngest, newest, hippest, uh, new missions don't have town elders, but for most of our main uh, churches, normal churches, this is a group that's over age 75. They've been in the church all their lives, and they're in every mainline church. So you're going to see a lot of town elders floating around. What do we learn quickly? How do we understand suburban attainment? Here's a picture of who they are, the 18th wealthiest segment in America, Group D. Donald and Sharon, these are not made up names. These are names that are real and they are the most used names in suburban attainment. How they know that, I don't know. Uh, you got me. But that is in fact true. And you know that 1.64% of all the houses in America are suburban attainment. 2.08% of all the people are suburban attainment. And how will we reach Donald and Sharon? Uh, how will we engage them? The, the number 100 is always the clue 
for any index score you see or anything, any number on a report when you're looking at, in this case, these are communication channel preferences. So uh, what we're going to do, here's our strategy. We're going to do a great four-color brochure that we can send out to Donald and Sharon. The problem is they score a 62 out of 100, which is the norm. What does that mean? Just throw the brochure away. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your postage. They're not going to read it. You with me? Churches need to understand this. And, and what about uh, cell phone? Well, they, they're pretty strong users of cell phone, although not ultra strong. They are clearly going to be uh, engaging through the Internet and a computer. So what does that mean for a local church? It means... They better have a website that is not just a bulletin, that also has links to things that the church is doing. Um, if you're beginning to reach younger people, it may also be connected to YouTube videos and so on. Now, here's where you really get them, with their email. And they watch a little broadcast TV, not much. They would stream podcasts. So if you record your sermons and you have podcasts available, you might catch these people, they're not in church on Sunday, maybe, but they might, they might go and listen to the podcast. These are technology wizards, and there's a whole bunch of information about, about that. What does that mean? Well, novices are, if you see a score for novices, technology has a limited impact on my life. Apprentices, technology is changing my life. Journeyman, technology is an important part of my life. And wizards, technology is life. And so when you look at what that means, novices are over age 55. Average income is about 61,000. But look at what the novices are typically doing. Uh, you know, they're going to be bird watching. They're going to, sorry, uh, they're going to be bird watching, uh, collecting plates, hunting. I don't know. I don't know how they get all this, but that, that's a profile. Apprentices, they're a little younger. Now they're more active. Look at the household income change. It's $94,000. So as it moves up in technology, so is the income. As you move to journeyman, they're, they're younger still. And look at this. The income moves up. And now you're in things that are even more active. And finally, when you get to the wizards, the average age is youngest. And uh, so you can see there is a, a, a fair amount of difference between these four groups. So in comparison to the one we just looked at, Striving single scene. Honestly, if, if you don't, your church doesn't have a smartphone app, you probably are not going to do very well with these folks, if they come at all, if they come at all to a, a, a worship service that would be normal. If they do, they're going to come with their smartphone in their hand. They're going to have their Bible app on the smartphone. I was sitting at a table. I, don't, uh, I was sitting at a table at this meeting at uh, dinner last night and there was some conversation around this kind of issue and the person speaking said something like well we had someone come to our church and they read the scripture from a tablet and this was not the Holy Bible how could the Holy Bible be in a tablet do you understand the mindset shift that has to happen for those of us, look at this room. Fortunately, there are, there are a couple of you that are a little, not quite as gray as most of us, but the point is, uh, we need to understand this. Yes. You gonna say something? I tell Google to read me my scripture for today. You what? I, <laughs> Sorry again? My Google, my Google Home is structured to read scriptures to me before I go to bed at night. There you go. So those of so you know I think for many of us some of us who are developer type folks have been around a little while, and we gotta we gotta tune in to what's going on. Yes, sir. I was just gonna kind of an anecdote. The day I knew it was time to leave my last church after five years, pouring my life out there, was we were battling with the administrative board about putting screens in the sanctuary, and we talked about the younger people who were starting to attend and how they read scripture off the screen. Right. One of our ladies spoke up and said, well, I read the real Bible. And, and about five of us applauded. Wow. 
It just, it just goes on and on and on. I, because I want to keep going, if you have not, how many of you are aware and understand what the Mission Impact Guide is? One of you? Two of you? Three of you? Maybe? It's like, I don't know. Okay, this is a way to read the individual uh, segments beyond what Experian provides. It's by Tom Bandy, and it's around nine ministry filters. So if we're looking at Striving Single Scene, which we just looked at a minute ago, this has been updated last year, and so basically what happens is it gives you comments about this household type that are directed at a local church team to have them have dialogue around what this would mean. Are we going to engage these people? And if we are, what will we have to do? And so, for example, uh, striving single scene, they are more likely to spend Christmas and Easter in a new Caribbean destination than in church. They are mainly concerned about status and recognition, self-improvement, and the latest fashions and technologies. If you were going to do a small group, you ought to have something that's around uh, uh, self-improvement or maybe even health or whatever, and they, they might very well likely meet not on a worship service Sunday, but some other place. This is a fresh expression kind of reality, probably. Um, they drive traditionalists crazy because they truly do like change for the sake of change. So you got your town elder on the board, and you begin to talk about this. Now Tom Bandy says, and I think he's right, that one of the things that causes churches not to be able to engage this new group is just plain fear of loss. And so if we can assist them in understanding what might happen and what it might be like, at least the stress level goes down a little. That doesn't solve all the problems, of course, but it does mitigate some of that kind of, of thing. So uh, leadership preferences, it talks about that. It talks about the different kinds of hospitality. It talks about uh, uh, actually all these filters. I just wanted to show you, we now have definitions. People don't know what these things mean, so the definitions are also included now in every one of the reports so you can read about hospitality, what the basics mean, what does takeout mean, what does small group leadership mean, what do we mean when we say worship, we don't talk about traditional and contemporary, we talk about educational, inspirational, transformational, coaching, it's a much more refined way of looking at what a worship experience is. And then facilities, I mean it's not does it look good or doesn't it look good, it's what kind of facilities and then what about finances and then ultimately the communication one is huge. So just be aware that's there. Um, when you run a comparative insight report, you can also see these are the households in the church. They have seven households in platinum prosperity at 300000 about per household. That's $2 million of gross income from just one of their household types in this church. How would you use this kind of information? Stewardship campaigns, capital campaigns. When you look at the total number of households, their gross income is $14,770,000. Now here's what I've learned um, over the years, and that is if, this is important, if churches will not dump their membership lists, let me say that again, do not let them upload their membership list, that is useless. They need to upload their active members, however they determine active members, and that would be, I would hope, at least attending a few times a year, and donors. Active members and donors. Why? Because now you got a profile here that is far more accurate, and for eight out of ten churches, regardless of size and regardless of tradition, you can almost bet the budget will fall between 2 and 3% on this table. Eight out of ten times, if they will upload their active people and donors, you will find the church's budget falls right here. And for those of us working in the, at the conference level, measuring church vitality, I'll tell you, the more vital the church is, the higher this number percentage is. And I found a few churches, a few at 5%, I've found fewer at seven. I can probably tell you 
in, in doing workshops and working with probably 20 denominations, I've maybe seen 10 churches at 7%. I've never want, not once found a 10 percenter. So even if a church does an extraordinary job of stewardship development, it's rare that you see the percentage giving at these kind of numbers. So uh, to do a, so here's what I want to do. I want to stop a minute. I've got 15 minutes. So, um, I think it might be good um, to do a couple of quick things and then go online and play with strategic things like a district analysis or something. Would that be helpful? You think that would be? Let me just show you for a second then. Um, you probably all are aware, but if you're not, I want you to be aware that uh, in the Quick Insight report, which is our, our least sophisticated report, you have basically themes which have graphics and tables. Uh, you, you also have, of course, like every one of our demographic reports, the information about mosaic household types. You have racial ethnic percentages, both the graphics and also the data tables. I specifically think it's helpful to look at households with children. I think that's an important part of the story for most churches. What you may not know is we have a Quick Insight Worksheet. Do all, how many of you know about the Quick Insight Worksheet? One. All right. So this is important. People want to know, what do you do with this stuff? How can we go to a local church and use it? Quick Insight Worksheet. It's on every Quick Insight report at the, uh, at the information page at the back, supporting material. It's also on the help menu. You can go to two different places. What is this whole process? Well, one of the things I learned a long time ago when I was doing uh, work uh, like you are in the conference is that every church thinks they already know everything they need to know about their environment. That's probably not true in your conference, but it was certainly true in mine. And so they also believe the information isn't right, you know, all this stuff. So one of the things I wanted to confront was let's just see how much they really do know. And so this workshop assumes that in step one, you're going to hand out this workshop sheet, this worksheet, without giving them any information. And you're going to have them working independently. And you're going to have them in groups of, you know, even a small church can do this. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this with small churches. You, if you've got ten people in your church, you can break them in groups of two. Or three, it's fine. And so, what is the population of your study area? So you tell them it's a three mile radius, it's two zip codes, whatever it is. And they have to write this in, and they will begin to grumble because they don't know how to do it. They have no clue what that number is. Is it going to grow or decline? And by what percentage? What's the average age? So they fill out the information. Step two. In groups of no more than five persons, create a group perce a, a perception, a common perception, a, a consensus. So think about that. At your table, if you each filled out the report, and you have a new piece of newsprint or however you do it, you would have to agree, well, what's the percentage growth? Well, what's the largest racial ethnic group? It's, it's a hoot because there's all this dialogue going on about what people think and what they don't. Then each small group shares their perception of the neighborhood with the big group. And what you're going to find is if you have three or four small groups, they're all different. There is no agreement, which means they don't really know. At that point, then, as they do that, uh, we will then return to the groups and share the actual Quick Insight report with the groups. So once they thought they, they had their answer, then we share the information. And at that point, you know, are there any surprises? What did you learn about the area that you didn't know? Uh, are there any confirmations of things that you knew? And then, thinking about determining your mission opportunity, reflecting on the story of everybody that's living in your study area, what are the three life concerns? Are there any life concerns that you saw? And let's list those three. And so they'll do that, list three life concerns. What are the ways our congregation is like the people of the study area? And they put those uh, in there. And then... Is there a significant, if there's a number of ways we're similar, which of our present ministries would connect? You list them. And then, 
how might we strengthen them? And then are there ways that our congregation is different? List those. Two potential new ministries, whoops, sorry, that you might start given the fact that you are, are different. And what are the steps necessary to integrate this into, into... Now, I understand this is a very short process, but that's what you need sometimes. It gets the, it gets the, the juices flowing and something is happening at that point. Any questions about that? All right. Let me go to the website. Okay. So what I'm doing right now is I'm clearing the map. One of the things you're going to see on the new website is look here. Instead of it coming out this way, now all of your choices are in a nice little circle. We're going to clear everything. They're cleared. And uh, this is now the reset zoom. It looks like the United States. And so we'll come over here. I'm not quite sure. There we go. So what I want to do is run an opportunity scan. Here's my question. Where are the top five growing? Let's, should we do a district or the annual conference? What do you want to do? You want to know about growth? You want, what are you interested in knowing in your study area? Anybody have a burning passion to learn something? African community in Charlotte. In Charlotte, okay. Well, I need to find the Western North Carolina Conference. And here we are. Is that a, you want to do a metro center, I assume. So I think what we'll do uh, is we're going to turn on the layers. And we're going to turn on standard layers. Uh, what county is that in? Would that be good enough, or should we do the dish Charlotte Metro? Charlotte Metro? Let me see if I can turn on the cities and, and find, help me find Charlotte quickly. Is that it? Okay. So what I've done is I've selected that metro area. Everybody with me? I've just turned on the standard layer, which is called cities. I've uh, actually uh, turned on the label and I've, I've clicked on select. I've selected it. Now what I want to do is a demographic selection. So I'm going to create an opportunity scan. And I'm going to select the variable I want. Let me make this a little go away for us. I want to do uh, racial ethnic trends. I want African American. Is everybody kind of following what I'm doing here? All right. Now the question is, if I'm looking at the Charlotte metro area, how do I want to break that area up? Do I want zip codes? Do I want census tracts where about, about 4,000 people? Do I want block groups which are neighborhood level? I'm going to go clear down to neighborhood level. That's about as tight as you can go, okay? So I'm going to say census block groups. Here, here are our options. You can even scan by school districts now. Block groups and click scan. Let us pray. Okay. We have it. God is good. And so now I'm going to go make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. So now what we're doing, we have a, we have a little different thing here now. This is actually showing us the population now. It's a little different than what you're used to seeing. Here is the scan results. And I, I realize it may be a little difficult to see some of the numbers, but maybe can you can you you can see them, can't you? Kind of okay. So here are the African American neighborhoods in rank order, because that's what we scan for. So I want to go to area number one. There it is right there. Area number two. There it is right there. Area number three. Well, are you learning where the African American population is in Charlotte? Yes, you are. Area number four. Well, it's so it's kind of north, and there, let's so let's go. Let's do the let's do the top one, two, three, four, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So now, you really, you really, in a matter of seconds, you've gotten your answer with regard to uh, that. Now, one of the things you can do that I love with the new system is uh, you, can, you can toggle full screen. I just love this. And, of course, you, you then can zoom in. Uh, this is good enough that you can do this live in a room with people now. I think it's the, the graphics are good enough. And, of course, what you can do at this point is select these, these areas. So here's what I would do if I was working in a group with people. First of all, it's too much color. So I'm, I'm going to go back to... You can change the color, by the way. This is neat. This is kind of a new, new little feature. Look at this. Isn't that cool? So now we're going to go back to uh, the regular screen. What I want to do is take the thematic mapping off the, the, the page because it's just too busy. So clear the map, only I'm going to clear just the thematic map opportunity scan. So now I've, I've got these locations. All right, they're a little easier to see. Now what I also want to do is I want to turn off the Charlotte boundary, because I, I just want to select these areas. These are block groups, if you recall. So now what I want to do is I want to go to uh, uh, layers, standard layers. I want to go to block groups. I've selected block groups. I'm going to turn off the city layer. I'm coming over here. You don't care about the block group label. That means nothing. But I want to select them. So I can go over here and click on the map and select that block group. Everybody with me? Now I want to do more than one. So I can hold the shift key down and do it, or I can select uh, multiples from active overlay. So I'm going to get that one. I'm going to get that one with me. I'm going to get that one, that one. So here's what I'm doing. I'm essentially building a custom report. So now I want the demographics. So I'm going to go to demographics. Everybody still with me or have I, have I lost you? You still tracking with me? All right. I can do a predefined report. And let's say what I want to do is I want to say this is not for the Western North Carolina Conference. This is going to be for, um, it's prepared for a new, well, this is be nice if it wasn't capitalized, sorry, a new African American, whoops, uh, mission, okay? And I want a predefined report, and I'm going to do the executive insight. I'm going to generate the report, and I've really, I'll be able to see some pretty significant information about this study area pretty quickly. Let us pray. Remember, this is on the staging site, so we don't have our main servers running this. And uh, let's go down and take a look. So let me make this bigger. So now we know there are uh, 8,860 households. Let's take a look at the African American presence. Uh, we're talking about 18,000 in those neighborhoods. Let's look at the African American income. That's going to be important. I don't have time to completely unpack this, but I want you to see. Here's the African American income. So it's 44,000 against some of the others you see there. You're going to want to look at family structure. You're going to want to look at mosaics. Uh, single parents are 58%. Hello. And now we're talking about the, uh, let's take a look at the mosaic segments, suburban attainment, number one. Look at the difference between the first and the second and the third. You've got affluence, you've got singles with not much money, you've got poverty. All within those three or four neighborhoods we selected. And then, I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but this generational information should be a part of your discussion with every church you go to today. It really should be a part of your discussion with every church you go to. 
I am going to be out of town. I've got one more thing I want to do. So what, here's what I want to do. I want to go back and I, I want to do another predefined report. Only this time I want it to be the ministry insight priorities. I want you to see this because this is a big deal. Um, the other piece of information I use regularly is from uh, the Religious Insight Priorities Report, the faith involvement level. Because whatever the numbers of people are in your study area, if you know 65% of them don't go to church anywhere, you can do the math and blow people's minds, honestly. With the number of people in your community that are not uh, in church. The other thing you can do with the uh, Religious Insight Report, the full one, you can look at the Methodist Preference, Methodist, and United Methodist Affiliation. What would you do with that? Well, you would do the numbers. If you know that 7% of the people surveyed in that community say they have a Methodist preference, doesn't mean they go, but you can still say, here are people who, in raw numbers who are looking for a Methodist tradition. And then you have people who say, I'm affiliated with the Methodist Church, which means at some point in time, I was a United Methodist. I may not be going. And those numbers are astounding. And so you can go to a local church and say, if we could just reach the people who are self-identified as Methodist preference. Or, you, hello? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, I'd, so I want to show you this one thing, and then we'll, we'll end, the, end the time. I'm sorry, that just we're just, so there's life concerns. What would you do with life concerns? Preaching, small groups. Okay, you need to see this. Um, top 15 ministry or program recommendations in the study area. Some of you have already heard me say this, but now I'm just beating the drum everywhere I go. We all know that it's extremely important for new mission, new communities to build relationships with people. That's kind of the number one thing. When we ask, did the, the survey nationally, and we asked the question, what out of 30 possible ministry uh, programs that people could choose, these are unchurched people, what would they look for? They're, well, they're unchurched and churched, it's population. By a mile, by a mile, not even, nothing even close to this, nothing even close. The ratio of responses, 5.9 to 2.6, warm and friendly encounters, was ahead of any other program suggestion. Which means that while sermons may be important and worship and music and all of that may be important, if we don't make opportunities for people to connect with people, it doesn't matter how cool you are on Sunday morning, they're gone. And I don't think our churches believe that. I think they believe that the better they do, the more people they'll get. That's not true. If we don't make ways and doors, and my little church that I'm trying to help now, I came out of a church plant that went from zero to 500 in about four years. I'm in a church of 100 that's landlocked with 400 families with kids in a 20-minute walk. They got about six. And when I talk with them about places, doors, you know, ways to engage, they've got small groups. They've got Sunday school classes that have been together for 35 years. That's going to work. They've got a men's group and a women's group. Oh, yeah. They don't get it. So somehow we as leaders need to make them understand it's building relationships that matters. It really does. If you want more assistance one-on-one, -on -one, let us know. I'm out of time. Whew. Thanks. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was helpful. Yeah. I've got cards, business cards, if anybody needs them. Most of you know how to get me, but I'll be glad to give you a card. So, Chuck, yes. one question quick on the warm and friendly encounters and the differential of the percentages. It is the ratio of those that responded. Uh, and so, and I don't, you know, to be, let me be candid. I'm not exactly sure how the ratio was, was uh, figured, but it has to do with the number of responses the 35 and how many responded, that was where the rate. So that, that's my question actually is when, when a group of people says, well, how do we know this information is correct? Yeah. What's the short answer? The short answer is we collected all of the national surveys, the 100,000 samples, and, we, and we, we knew how many selected that particular one against the samples, and it was a calculation, mathematic calculation. And I'll be, a, I can give you a better answer. Just let me think about that. I can't, I'm not going to make one up. I'll get it over, I'll get it over coffee.
Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yes, sure, sure. One, one of the things that's been difficult, just in a, a work that we're on right now, is because the way that the inside access is structured, I, I had to go to a developer in another conference. Oh, no, you don't. We'll fix that for you. Okay, thank All you. All we got to do is turn on the boundary of the state next to you, and you're golden. Okay, I, I had difficulty getting that to work. That was my uh, problem, so. Well, you, you, you can't. The, the, uh, if you were trying to look at the entire state boundary, you, you should be able to run a report. For example, if we turned on Illinois, you should be able to run a report anywhere on the boundaries. Like if, if we're talking about uh, Davenport, you should be able to, to do Rock Island if you have the Illinois boundary turned on. Get in touch with us. Talk, call Michelle Saxon or chat with her. Tell her what you need. We'll fix it. That was hard, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. I have a quick question. When you were doing, um, you were doing all of that and mapping out the, the top, the top. Yes. Top, there's one, one in particular that was right smack in the middle. Would there be a way to add that so you could see if there, if there would be a marrying? Um, you can click any geography on that table and add it to it. I just selected the ones I thought were closest. I just want to know if you can select something that's not just that particular. Here. Absolutely. In other words, you can uncheck or check or click or unclick. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. What I didn't show you is build your own report. If you've never built your own report, that's great. You don't have to list, You don't have to read through all of our. You can actually build your own report, ask your own questions. It's one of the solutions. You just want to know about African Americans. You want to know about mosaics. You just maybe you want to know about households with kids by grade. Well, click on that. We will probably do. No, not probably, we will be doing probably four national webinars sometime this fall when this new system rolls out because we want all of our main users to go through a tutorial with us and that's what we did when we put the, the new system out last time about three years ago, two years ago. That worked well, we had four and five hundred people on the webinar so uh, you know, we'll do that. Uh, I think probably the next thing that will happen is Small videos. We, we're, help me understand. I'm sorry, I don't want to keep you. I want to know the answer to this. We're trying to figure out what the best way is to support users. I've had a bias that printed material people don't read anymore, that they really watch videos. I also understand they don't want to watch long videos, which means it's three minutes or less. That means I can do one thing and create a video, and two things and create a video, you know. So, is that the right consensus? Is it is that short videos are a better solution? For example, how do I change the thematic map color palette? Here's a video. How do I do a polygon? Here's a video. How do I do a, a, a custom report? Here's a video. Does that make better sense than trying to put it in a printed piece? And, and linking them to the, the, the menus would be helpful. So in other words, when like you have... Yeah, yeah, because there's some on our, our user assistant window, how do you do? Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm fighting with the engineers about putting those labels <laughs> on because they don't think it looks good to have a bunch of print. And I'm trying to tell them, I really don't care what you think. I mean, I, I, people, need, people need to use it. They need to understand it. It doesn't have to look marvelous at every point. If you don't know what to do, you've got to be able to click and get an answer. And people don't click things with no labels. Thanks. I'm done. If you need to leave, go ahead. I'll take questions or whatever. Uh, so when you hover over, if the alt text comes up, that's helpful. Um, in the short videos, I don't know if it's the same thing as what I've learned is that younger <coughs> persons have caught on to this um, binge watching on Netflix. And yes. So and, you, and YouTube. Short videos yeah. In line. That's a great idea. Yeah. They'll watch, sequence, they'll watch 15 videos. That's a great idea, Dan. Okay, that's that's a good that's a good insight for the next planning meeting. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, everybody. The new mapping interface. I'm sorry. Yes, right. What will happen is we will send an email blast out to all users, 
Anybody that's a user in Mission Insight will get an email from us that says we're doing, we're doing videos. There are going to be webinars to sign up for. Yep. Okay. Thank you much. Hey, my pleasure. Good to meet you, Victor. Okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'll ask you a question. Yes, sir. How do you bridge what you said today and what Ola said yesterday for a guy that sees himself as a novice and even interest um, technology and computers and all that, yet with my, with my role in working with our district. Oh, and I have a question. Okay, okay. 